Uh, the presenters tonight are Margot Griswold with Jonathan Coffin. Um, Margot has presented to this group several times in the past, and we always have new experience and uh, educational experience, and I suspect that tonight won't be any different. Margot has over 27 years' experience in habitat restoration and soils, landscape, position, and hydrology, coupled with existing and historic vegetation guide her work in restoration. She's done uh, work in consensus planning for plant and wildlife habitat within the Habitat Work Group of the Owens Lake Control Project in Yo County, California. Uh, she's past president of the Society for Ecological Restoration California and the Los Angeles Audubon Society. Jonathan Coffin, who most of us know, is a naturalist and a photographer of exceptional talent. He's dedicated decades to photographing the biodiversity of the Biona wetlands and verifying his discoveries with other scientists. He can be found day or night documenting the wildlife, plants, animals from the edges of the Biona wetlands ecological reserve. So with that said, uh, Margo, uh, screen share. Okay. And it's up to you. Let her rip. Okay, thank you. Good evening, and thank you again for having me and uh, Jonathan. Um, I know you never get tired of seeing Jonathan's amazing photographs, and I hope that I can do uh, justice to your asking me back again. Actually, this evening I'll be trying to show inconsistencies and overlooked opportunities for the Biona wetlands. So you've heard these things before um, from various members of the airport marina group and others, other scientists. And um, I'm just trying to pull the threads together to see, you know, can, can we convince the proponents for the um, plan for the final EIR for the Biona project. Can we convince them to join us in a facilitated stakeholder process and reach a consensus? Right here, I'm, I'm showing you um, Jonathan's most recent here on the left of the screen, the crotch's bumblebee. So this is a threatened species listed at California sour fig. And Jonathan just found this today and, and uh, had it verified. He's gone back in his records from 2005 that he saw it there. It's also been recognized in the 1980s uh, Schreiber report. And so this is the persistence. This is why we care about, about a good plan for the Biona wetlands. Because these species persist, like the Tongva persists as a people, so does the wildlife. And here we have a sweat bee visiting a, a laurel sumac, up close photo. So let me uh, see if I can, no, there we go. So I would like to also acknowledge the Gabrielina Tongva peoples. This is their land, their traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory. And so we need to remember that. And I believe their word or one of their words for this area is, it is full of water. And so I'll start with the inconsistency of the final EIR with the surface and groundwater hydrology and the historical ecology of the Biona wetlands. The EIR is inconsistent. Their plan is inconsistent with what we know. The plan 
really hasn't changed much as we saw if you attended the UCLA symposium, the URSA symposium uh, last Tuesday afternoon. The plan really hasn't changed much since the mid 2000s. And it looked tired then and it's more tired now. There are inconsistencies and there are real opportunities to make this a better plan. So in terms of stakeholders and the territory of the Gabrielino Tongva were invisible as well. The Tongva were invisible. To my knowledge, uh, John Tommy Rosas, who is a direct um, identified as a descendant of the Tongva, and made many presentations. And I encourage you to look at the airport marina presentations that he made when he was alive. Um, and still, there was no change to the plan. There has been limited stakeholder community involvement overall, not just from the indigenous people's point of view, but from everyone in the community. There were a few meetings, but mostly once the science advisory panel was named, it was a top-down type of system. They would meet and then they would report. And there were opportunities for some comment, but not in a way that was acknowledged. So the plan remains the same. Despite community input to the contrary and recent science. The current plan you're likely mostly aware of here is, um, you know, this, this orangey color is all termed upland or non-tidal. <laughs> I find it weird. There's a lot of upland that they're... Um, carving out here. And, and then you see their romantic idea of a creek that never actually came that far. Bayona Creek generally stopped here at Lincoln and then spread out and mostly area A and spread throughout. Now keep in mind that the Bayona wetlands included what is now Marina del Rey and all the way the Grand Canal to Venice was wetland. It was an immense wetland. Um, we've brought this up before. The plan, the term as a restoration is not a restoration. Um, Ecological restoration seeks to initiate or accelerate ecosystem recovery following damage, degradation, or destruction. And the goal of ecological restoration is to return a degraded ecosystem to its historic trajectory. History plays an important role in restoration, but contemporary conditions must be accounted for in planning. So let's look at the project in sort of each of these uh, ideas. We know from the historical ecology of the Bayona Creek watershed that the Bayona wetlands, for the most part, was a closed coastal wetland. In other words, it wasn't a full tidal wetland. It wasn't experiencing tides every day around the clock of the year. It would, on occasions of high runoff from the Los Angeles River, joining with the Bayona Creek um, 
exhibit such strength that the dune system here on the west portion would be broken through by the river to the ocean. And then, as described by the classification of California estuaries, there is a natural closure pattern based on the direction of the wave actions, based on how much water is still coming from the creeks and based on the strength of the sand being uh, moved towards closure. And so over most of its time, Biona was a closed system. They had salt marshes, yes, salt marshes. There were freshwater, riparian um, meadows. There was um, brackish water. These all existed within the large complex and we're showing here the complex of the Biona wetlands around 2000 acres. What we're talking about right now is down here, just 600 acres. So this is what's been lost. We know from documents from 2011 and uh, both these studies have been brought to the attention of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and um, other proponents of the project. However, they're given lip service and have not made an impact on the planning for the project. Uh, Dave Jacobs was part of the URSUS seminar symposium last week and he gave an excellent, uh, I thought, presentation on the closure patterns and uh, how other lagoons have been opened unnaturally for full tidal, um, be, to become full tidal estuaries. And the problems that that uh, develops from sedimentation. He also showed that if you open Biona up to a full tidal over the entire wetland, you may run into problems of deposition that would result in unplanned for uh, actions in the wetland. Now the historical ecology is, um, you know, many different accounts assembled. It's a science. It's not just somebody's picking one small map like uh, the T-sheets that are being used to drive the current plan. The historical ecology looks at a variety of historical maps, accounts, newspaper reports, diaries, et cetera, to assemble the likely historical ecology. And in this case, it was a particular time frame that they were looking at starting in the 1800s. So here's what we have. We know it well. Area A, area B, north and south, and area C. Dissected by roads, by the Biona flood control channel and cut off from its water, its fresh water, by the dumping of pumped groundwater as well as uh, rainwater being pumped actually out into Biona Creek and not allowed to naturally come into the wetlands. So it's really being starved for um, years from its water. When I discussed the trajectory of an ecosystem in terms of restoration, the 
idea of history and what is uh, also available in the region is often considered. And so if we look and what we know of lagoons south of Bayona and even north to the central California, except for um, Monterey Bay, San Diego Bay, most of the lagoon habitats, and this is from North San Diego County, uh, this is a historical change. So we know there have been huge changes. And in salt marsh, there's been a 12% loss. In salt flats, such as the salt pan, 90%. Likely because people look at it and say, well, nothing, there's nothing there. But they're not looking at it from the point of view of the ostracods that are there or the birds that seek the ostracods. And open water mudflat historical acreage has increased 615%. Freshwater brackish wetlands have decreased 54%. So, and there's been a huge amount developed in contemporary times in these coastal wetlands. So you, you say, well, how did this open water mudflat increase so much when everything else is decreasing? Mainly through misguided projects, restoration that were needed for mitigation for open water, for ports and other such activities or for, you know, um, hydro, uh, not hydro, but nuclear power plants on our coast. So we wanna look at that and say, do we want Biona to be just like all the other lagoon habitat types changing to a full tidal jettied open so the tide can come in and along with that maintenance issues of sedimentation or do we want to reclaim and restore rehabilitate and enhance what we find there now which is fresh brackish wetlands salt marsh and salt flats so this is an inconsistency I find with the project. So also, and I'm not the first to say this, so just so we're clear on this, I'm taking this from things I've read, other people's talks, um, and trying to kind of synthesize it together. Can't we look at all the other components that are pretty much tidal that are within the old footprint of the Biona wetlands, the Biona Lagoon, the Del Rey Lagoon down here in the center, the Oxford Lagoon, even uh, the Grand Canal, even Marina Del Rey. So some species, these are nurseries for aquatic species. Birds use these areas. And I think it's a missed opportunity for the plan not to consider the entire former wetland and what we can do. This is um, you know, an example of how these lagoons are linked. So the tidal organisms are here and, and this is a Jonathan's recent photograph of the semi-palmate sandpipers massing, getting ready to migrate, and they're uh, feasting in the lagoons. And along the channel, also offering the Biona flood control channel in this area, 
uh, is a soft bottom. And here we have uh, a great um, belted kingfisher. I believe it's a female. Uh, we know there are fish out there. We've seen sea lions feeding on fish. We've seen the fish for ourselves. We've seen the birds diving for the fish. So there are tidal waters and organisms already within the old Biona wetlands. Jonathan's photograph, the tiger beetle, which is on the uh, mudflats, and killifish over in uh, area A at the Fiji Slough. Fiji Slough with some egrets in the water, a missed opportunity. Why can't we use what we find in an efficient way? Opening up area A and B north to tidal flows will not protect existing species against sea level rise. So here's Marina del Rey, open. Here's area A, B, and C. So opening this up, if we're to believe the EIR, will protect the species from sea level rise. But this would be the only study I've found that proposes to dig out a wetland, coastal wetland, to protect it from sea level rise, to dig it out and make it lower than current sea level. So this seems to be an inconsistency. Within the document, they actually, um, they actually state that they'll remove between two and three million cubic yards, it's a lot, of soil. And they will use most of that soil to create large new levees and berms. And, but they reserve the right, and this is in a couple of studies that I've read from 2012 on to um, the current uh, EIR. They reserve the right to actually use soil that they've taken out to put it back for building up the wetlands once they've allowed the ocean to come in. So to me, that's an inconsistency. Here's the plan and these are the changes as we go through the years. Walter Lamb presented this in his presentation a few weeks ago where you see the orange again is all upland. The light green is low marsh. Dark green is mid-marsh. Well, mid-marsh has gone to low marsh in just a few years with sea level rise predicted. And it continues that way. Now, the low marsh is mud flat and we continue with uh, low marsh taking over high marsh. And finally, we're getting really uh, less and less diverse in habitats as the mudflats take over. And here we are in 2100. So you, you see it's gone from our salt marsh mid low, mid, and high to open water and mud flow. And where did all the species go that were there? 
Well, the Belle de Savannah Sparrow that Jonathan captured here in area B in the pickleweed likes to have a, a, a rather wide band to nest, to mate, nest, set up their territories. So that very narrow band that you see developing by 2050 means likely that we're not going to have building savannah sparrow there. So we're not even protecting our uh, one of our listed species. We certainly aren't protecting anything else. We're changing the entire system. To say nothing of the inconsistency with the state of California's groundwater management plans to allow saltwater intrusion into aquifers. And these aquifers were given short shrift in the final EIR, the draft EIR as well. No real hydrology studies were done. Hydraulic studies on the creek, but no real hydrology study and they refer to a few uh, studies, but they don't refer to some of the more recognized groundwater studies. So it's an uh, inconsistency. Also, this is recent, just two Sundays ago, I saw the uh, a tsunami risk for Los Angeles County had been updated by the California Geologic Survey. And so I, I thought, oh, I wonder what that looks like for the Biona wetlands. So here we have, um, here we have Marina del Rey. So you see that it's all the boat slips and edges are at risk. So the yellow means at risk from tsunami. Here's the Biona flood control channel. And so it's at risk up to the, just beyond the 90 and a little into the um, Sentinella Creek. But you notice area A, area C, area B is not at risk. But I think if we dig it out, as they did with Marina del Rey, remember Marina del Rey was part of the wetland, part of the salt marsh. And uh, this is what happens when you dig out a salt marsh, a coastal marsh protected by a double dune system and open it up to the ocean for tsunami. And I'm guessing sea level rise. Well, we saw that they, in their own EIR, they projected what happens with sea level rise. But this is something I'm not sure they looked at in the document itself. But what are the risks to the wetlands and all the access um, paths and trails and such when a tsunami comes in once they've lowered this area? So it's a, just another inconsistency that I see. And inconsistency and missed opportunities in terms of water, rather than lowering the wetlands to receive tidal flow every day, why aren't we using the water that's there. So here we have seasonal rainfall. This is what Biona looks like. We also have water that's being dumped, a tremendous amount of water that Patricia McPherson has documented is being dumped into Biona Creek from the Playa Vista development in order to keep all their gas uh, monitoring situations viable and in they dump that water out but that water is an opportunity that water should be in the biona wetlands 
And with that water, we could have, you know, more vegetation, more opportunity for wildlife. This is just a photo that encapsulates a couple of inconsistencies um, with the final EIR. Besides the hydrology and vegetation is the baseline. So this was in um, 2012, uh, Jonathan discovered these drains. If you look here in the left upper where my pointer is, these drains are in the ground. So they're draining at the surface, but they're also draining about six feet down. They have leap holes on them. So they're draining any soil water. So this is the, um, a photo of the drain that's in the south area. These drains were not permitted. They were put in over 20 years ago. And so they've been draining. And this is what they base their existing conditions on this side. This is what I saw last year, three years after capping. This is pickleweed. Here we see a little pickleweed here. This is all annual grasses all the way over to the berm. And here you see the berm in my photo little different lens than what Jonathan was using. So this came from the rainwater not being drained and the groundwater not being drained. So there are the opportunities we're talking about. And here's uh, just where these unpermitted drains are in area B north. And uh, Patricia McPherson again, um, the Coastal Commission acknowledged the drains had to be capped and that thus they were capped. But one still wonders why those drains are there. They're draining and they're joining the drain from the freshwater marsh that's taking the water from Playa Vista and dumping it into the Bionic Creek flood control channel. Why is the question. Why did they put these drains in? We've heard that they don't really drain anything. But I still have the question, that's a real inconsistency. I don't know very many people that would pay to have those drains put in if they weren't going to actually drain water. Another inconsistency is the um, placement of fill from Marina del Rey. And this is the basis for the project claiming they need to take this two to three million cubic yards of soil because all of A was covered <clears throat> in fill from the marina. Now remember that fill, that um, dredge material was good wetland soil placed in area A. This is from a document of the um, Playa Vista EIR, and it shows the location of uh, artificial or deposited fill. So these areas that are crosshatched is where the fill was. Undisputed that there's fill in area C, but area A, Yes, there's some on the edges, but in general, this central area is not filled and none in area B. So um, I believe uh, Dr. Dave Jacobs you know, commented on this uh, briefly in his presentations because this type of wetland that is closed it's also perched, so it's higher than one would expect. And we think that they just have made an error here. But um, they're sticking with it. They're going to remove a lot of soil. 
and make large berms in place of what they already have, there are levees that hold the water from the Biona flood control channel just fine. But they're going to make larger berms and tear up the whole place. This is uh, Hordium depressum, a rare grass found in um, wet meadows, coastal meadows. And Jonathan found this in the middle of area A where supposedly 10 to 20 feet of fill from the marina had been placed. So it needs uh, low spots, meadow low spots to develop. So this is a species that was there. And it's uh, inconsistent, the fact that Jonathan found it, the fact that there are documents that show there hasn't been all the fill they talk about. Um, these are some linked inconsistencies. I call them linked. Um, and they go to things we've discussed. They're claiming carbon sequestration will be greater with the full tidal habitats. Um, at the symposium, there was a lot of vague talk, and I need to look into this, but I'm pretty sure that that's old data. And with all the new information about carbon sequestration and soils and what soil organisms and what the whole soil ecosystem brings to the table has not been considered. Nor has the time been considered that the carbon sequestration of functioning soils that they want to remove, uh, you know, that is going to cause a release of carbon. And they're not accounting for that. And I believe Walter Lamb mentioned that it could even be a negative. I don't think they'll ever recover once they move all that soil. And they're not considering if in fact the soil was rehabilitated and we had vegetation other than annual weedy species, if we had uh, native perennial species grasses, perennial grasses have incredibly deep roots, incredible soil micro, micro fungi interactions. All of these contribute to carbon sequestration. And so it really wasn't analyzed and it's an inconsistency. The document and plan didn't evaluate the full range of alternatives. They never really gave full view of a fresh, brackish, marsh, closed system alternative. And thus, they compare Biona in their California rapid assessment uh, methods to entirely inappropriate systems of open uh, water systems, open tidal systems. So of course, Biona comes out on the short end of that stick. So that's an inconsistency in its in inappropriate use of CRAM. And they also equate the no project with no management. Rather than evaluating an alternative that enhances and rehabilitates with available hydrology and in relation to the region. So they just say, oh, no project, it'll get worse. Well, that assumes absolutely no management, which is just not reality. There has to be management. There is ample recent information. And in fact, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences 
has published a study that the uh, the current biodiversity crisis is often depicted as struggles to preserve untouched habitats. But what you really find is there's been a deep cultural connection with biodiversity in all these habitats. It's been the colonialization and the extractive uh, processes of that colonialization that has brought about the majority of the loss of biodiversity. And so it continues to have real world consequences, including failed policies of ecological restoration. And I think that's what we're seeing here. So we know all about the weeds. We know all about the maps of the weeds and how bad it's gotten since uh, CDFW has taken over. But what they never tell you and what Jonathan does tell you is how much the area is used by wildlife. Here are the coyotes in area A. Here are all the native species we're finding of plants in area A, of butterflies, Lewis's evening primrose, another rare species, and the birds. We can't forget the birds. California Thrasher, if you ever go down the bike path, he's often calling to you right off, off of area A. The kites rest in area A and we have a triumvirate of species here in area A. So cute. And here's a whole lek of male honey-tailed bees on Laurel Sumac. You see them all? Here they are, all congregating, getting ready to mate with female. Um, in area B, we have the salt marsh bordered by uh, riparian areas. We have a, a, a multitude of bird species, of skippers, the wandering skipper, monarch butterfly, sadly, not so many this year. And the salt flat, here are the ostracods I mentioned. Here are what the birds are after. So these, these little guys live in the salt pan and they go dormant when it's dry, but as soon as the rain comes, they come alive, kind of like sea monkeys. And the birds are on the prowl. The salt pan is a big area for gathering prior to migration. In area B, we've got um, alkali heath or frankenia and wandering skipper there, the fiery uh, sandhill skipper on alkali mallow. These are all native species. And here's the orb weaving spider. These are all out there. The short-eared owl on his rounds. And I just find that you're not going to see these species once they open it up and you have sea level rising and the low marsh gives way to mud flats and the mid marsh, finally the high marsh. You'll have levees and the levees will be controlled by what you can put on those levees. So they won't be uplands like you see restored on the bluffs just south of Bayona. No, these levees will be very sparse and uh, they won't allow these ground squirrels to have anything to do with those levees. So what are they gonna do to keep the ground squirrels 
from those levees. Here are the rabbits in some Cressa, a native salt species. King snake. So we just have all these missed opportunities to maintain the biodiversity that exists, that persists, even in the face of all the indignities that Biona has suffered. There are natural soils, there's natural hydrology, and there's existing vegetation, or we can restore to some historic vegetation. And clearly, there's existing wildlife. I'm gonna hurry a little because it's getting late. Um, again, this is area A. Remember this area is not fill. It's polystyrene, freshwater wetland. But we could have an opportunity with Fiji Ditch to have something. These are all opportunities that we can look at. There's connections to area C we could develop. There's all type of things to consider if only we could all sit down together instead of being told top down what's gonna happen. Here's Fiji Ditch again. And here's all the citizens of the C area, the much maligned sea area. There's a lot going on in the sea area, including a ca California gnat catcher, a listed species, a Lewis's evening primrose as well, horned larks, and the burrowing owl, a species of concern, as well as the monarchs, because there's, um, there is a, uh, <laughs> and now I'm forgetting the name of it. <laughs> okay, I'm getting old. <laughs> Thank you, milkweed. Oh, my goodness. Um, and some more bird species. This is uh, Jonathan's famous photograph. These are the stakes that were put in for the Annenberg uh, complex that was proposed for area C and which would have paid for the uh, restoration of the rest of Biona, I believe. Luckily not happening. Buckeye on coyote bush. And here we have our net catcher again on salt bush. And let's not forget the ants. These are part of the soil ecosystem. So they're the ones we can see that come up and they're big enough we can see them. These are native Pocono Myrmex seed collectors. They're going about their business. They're, uh, they're mighty, they're mighty ants. I've heard that um, opponents of the plan have been compared to ants. We're nothing but ants. Well, I'll take that. I think ants are pretty powerful. Here's rattlesnake weed, close up and from a, a view high up. So that's persisting. This is a native species of euphorb in the uh, area C. And Frankenia, alkali heath. So this is a plant I found in a higher elevation areas near coastal areas. Um, it's uh, quite a robust species and it persists. So it gives us an indication of what's possible. Here's the Lewis's primrose again and the horned larks. Gopher snakes. We've had king snakes, gopher snakes, we have rattlesnakes and side blotch lizards as well as this western fence lizard. Let's not forget access. There's an inconsistency because not only are they saying they're going to uh, make Biona resilient to sea level rise and they're going to sequester more carbon, but they're going to give more access. They could give us that access now. Only a few groups have access and it's very limited. 
currently, you know, once a month, pre-COVID and hopefully soon, um, there's an open wetlands. It's very managed. People aren't allowed to um, go off on their own. They're given a, a tour with uh, excellent docents. There are a couple of other groups that have um, events at the wetlands. And there are school groups that come to the wetlands, almost uh, 2,300 students just with one nonprofit organization. Imagine if some of the other nonprofit organizations who would like to also have an education program and use the public land were able to have students come from underserved communities and schools for field trips within their watershed, because this is their watershed, the Bayona watershed. So it's an inconsistency and we're not gonna have public access for at least 10 years. That's if they move forward right away. It's gonna take that long, but there, there are gates, there are plans for an interim access plan. There are gates and benches in area A to allow the public in. So it's, it's really an inconsistency to claim they need to do the project in order to have access. Nonsense. People are going up and down the bike lanes on the Bayona flood control channel. They could open up the south side so separate the bikes right now from the walkers. There's recently opened a park to playa trail that comes all the way from the Baldwin Hills. There's plenty of opportunity right now. And so I would say, can't we have a facilitated forum of all the interested stakeholders? including indigenous tribal stakeholders, state and federal agencies, nonprofits, and the public, as well as consulting scientists if they want to attend. We would have to agree to things such as the same representative throughout the process so that you don't start over again each time like Groundhog Day. It's a process. And it's a time consuming process. And stakeholders would agree within that meeting, what comes out of the meeting is a common message and developed by the nonpartisan facilitator and agreed to by the stakeholders. And that's what goes out. So work through the science to consensus and work together for consensus and not fighting amongst ourselves. And there's some day-to-day -day rules of working together in this way. And I know I've, I've done this, I've lived through this. It's a very interesting process and it works. The people have to come together to create a problem solving environment. So problems, disagreements are to be solved rather than to be battles that are to be won. And you have to listen openly and discuss issues with other who hold diverse views. Refrain from ascribing motives or intentions to other participants. That's a hard one, but we can do it. Respect the integrity and value of other participants. And then you honor time so we don't go on and on, like I'm trying to honor time tonight. Use conversational courtesy. Appreciate humor, but do not engage in humor at the expense of others. And keep your cell phone silent during meetings. This is just an outline from another group I worked with in the Owens Valley. Very contentious process when it started, but working together, many of the factors in the habitat work group that I was in 
have come to um, consensus on planning and operations of the dust control for habitat and wildlife. It was a three or four year process. So I, I don't take this work on lightly. I don't suggest you do, but it's a way because right now it's not working in my opinion. So I have some ideas. Um, of course, I would come into such a, a facilitated working group with ideas, but I'll work together and I would hope others would want to take this on if we could get such a consensus planning group together. Thank you. Uh, Margo, thank you again for such a wonderful journey into the Biona and all of your inconsistencies. I, I think it's a, it, it's a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful trip and it raises so many questions. I, I, I have a few things here. Here, somebody had asked Rick Pine, or how long ago was that when it was 2,000 acres, is what he would like to know. How long ago was 2,000 acres? Um, yeah. Well, it started being uh, developed. Uh, so the first tea sheets were done in the mid-1800s. But according to Dave Jacobs, the area was grazed by um, Spanish land grants, well, 150 years before the 1850s, uh, Biona started to be impacted. And, uh, you know, the Biona flood control channel was planned and put in in the 1930s. Uh, Marina del Rey in the late 1960s, Venice Canal, the Grand Canal, the Bayona Lagoon, those were all connected, but they had jettied systems in the 1800s. So really the most damaging uh, things started probably in the 1800s, early 1800s. Okay, would, thanks. Would you say that the greatest loss of, of wetlands was when the marina was built, though, in the 60s? That was a big blow, yes. Uh, Margo, uh, Ben asks, what is the risk to a wetland from water intrusion? From saltwater intrusion? I suspect yeah. that's what he's asking. So the risk is to the groundwater? Uh, right. And so you get saltwater intrusion and uh, the water turns, you can get all that saltwater. I mean, there is a lot of work done in Southern California, coastal areas to prevent saltwater intrusion. Uh, so this plan could bring saltwater intrusion. The Silverado and Biona aquifers are connected according to the Poland report. Patricia McPherson is following closely the California uh, groundwater plan being uh, prepared right now for the Biona area watershed. Tom Williams has a question. Tom, are you there? So Patricia has a comment while we're waiting for Tom. Okay. I just didn't have her slides. Shows that there was no fill in area A, but those... Um, disturbed areas shown on the Playa Vista report, archaeological report, could have been just from the roadways for the oil wells and derrick areas and gas wells, so likely due to that disturbance, and also from the levee and roadway edges, so there was potential there but not what they're talking about, not the giant amount they're talking about in area A. Tom, are you there? 
Yes, I hope so. Okay, Can you, hear you have me? a question? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, actually, a comment regarding the opening of the sandbar of the Bayona system occurred, I think, in the early 20s, 1920. It was for lumber delivery to an expanding Marina del Rey, Playa del Rey, and the low areas in the area. Uh, we're going to be getting some aerial photographs of 1920 to 1940 uh, sometime next week and can tell you much more detail. The real ceiling of Bayona's fate was when you had the flooding of the L.A. River and the area south of downtown L.A., uh, during the 30s, and that's where the concrete lining of the river and the L.A. River was directed to the south rather than leaving it go to the west. So but we'll get some real detail next week. Yes, that's, that's all. I would agree the the um, the energy from the L.A. River was taken away. <laughs> 1825, and then as development increased, um, there may have been some replacement with hardscape, but nothing like when the LA River would combine with Bayona Creek to break through the dune system. So the trajectory of Bayona was less and less to break through and more and more as a closed system. But it was never full title, unless you want to go back 4,000 years. Margo, did, uh, Todd wanted to know, did you submit that photograph? I guess it's the tsunami photograph from August 2020 to CDFW. That's 2021. So it just came out two weeks ago, Todd, because there was a comment on tsunami on the draft, draft EIR and the final EIR <clears throat> of the... Uh, Increasing the risk to Culver Boulevard, I believe, which is a tsunami escape route. So what about damage to all of the soil and subsoil systems in Bayona when they're going to be pulling out 3 million cubic yards of, uh, mm. of soil uh, right. going down 20 to 25 feet? That's, uh, that's a lot of history of soil and subsoil systems, mycorrhizal systems and things like that. That would never be able to be reproduced. Um, that would be a tremendous loss. It would take hundreds of years to reproduce it. So, yes, you could start, you can kickstart uh, the system, but you wouldn't replace it. That's why I think there's a, a disconnect and maybe an inconsistency with the calculation of carbon sequestration. I think that should be looked at more closely. Just the timing, just the amount of energy it's going to take to remove that soil. Removing the soil and the release of the carbon from the soil. The amount of time the salt marsh, tidal marsh would take to develop doesn't happen immediately. Mm. Uh, I think even in the EIR, they acknowledge it's a, a loss. And not a, right. There's not a net gain of sequestration over the near term. So I just think that they, it's catchy because it's what our governor wants. He wants to account for climate change. So sequester carbon, we need to be resilient to sea level rise. And we need to provide access. Things can happen right now without that project. You don't have to take it away to put it back. Todd has a question for you, Margo. Yeah, yeah just a clarification. I was uh, specifically talking about the photo of the habitat rebound around the capped pipes oh. in August 2020, because that was... Uh, that was taken before the um, certification of the EIR. Mm -hmm. And I was, I mean, that's one of my concerns as the attorney who is challenging the adequacy of the EIR is that all this incredible information that everybody has, if 
if they didn't submit it to California Department of Fish and Wildlife, it essentially doesn't exist for the, the litigation. And so well, that, you know, that comment, photo, the comment was made that the baseline was not accurate. Yeah. It, 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 and I agree. I just see, you know, the more information, the better. For I example, did, I did submit that to. Uh, um, I'm trying to the Coastal Conservancy. Okay, that might work. I mean, if it's sent to Richard Brody or you know, <laughs> anybody else, you know, it, it, we'll see what the record has. But okay. but. You know, the more photographs, the more evidence that, you know, I'm very thankful that somebody submitted the entire EIR from Playa Vista into the record so that I know that I have that um, that yeah. map of the fill and, you know, things like that. Every little thing like that um, will, will be helpful. I'm pretty sure that David Jacobs submitted the entire report uh, that that they wrote on the closure patterns of Southern California lagoons. Well, I did too, actually. So okay. I know that's in there. <laughs> so <Okay>, good. <laughs> so Margo, I think that Patricia has a question about the bumblebee and its reliance upon grasses. Is that it, Patricia? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? I'd like to hear about that. That's a brand new photo that Jonathan just got. I want to hear about the bumblebee. <laughs> so the bumblebee, I looked it up because unless Jonathan wants to talk about it. It showed endangered on the thing that Jonathan sent me. Yeah. Um, and that its numbers were lowering even in 2014. So... I, this is a real special find. Also, that the fact that it's using the the fig, the ice plant that you've always called the you know the plant that's the intermittent plant that is very useful out there until we have natives growing in. I found the uh, crotches uh, bumblebee on on my walks. Actually, uh, the Schreiber report in 1981 listed it as being present. They had a list of uh, four bumblebees. They had the California bumblebee. Uh, Sonoran bumblebee, uh, yellow face bumblebee, and the uh, crotches bumblebee. There's another one too that I haven't seen yet. But since that time, uh, it, the population of the crotches bumblebee has gone down, where it's uh, endangered, uh, endangered today. Uh, so um, on my walks, when I walk down Culver, I'm always uh, scanning all the ice plant there because that's where I always find the bumblebees there all the time because mm. when I, I learned about the crotches bumble, bumblebee I, I was always making a point of looking for it trying to find it but it's kind and of you had, you had an ID on it also tell us about who ID'd it first of all first of all it looks kind of like a California bumblebee so I had I have to look at them really closely so I I, I figured it looked it really did look like a crotches bumblebee so I I posted it on iNaturalist where a naturalist can post their photos and get research grades from people that are like experts and things. So uh, uh, somebody specializes in bees and wasps. His name is John Asher. So he, so I posted it last night and this morning I, I go and it's crotches bumblebee. And mm -hmm. there was another uh, research grade for it. So the two people, at least at this time have, have verified that it is crotches bumblebee and it is endangered. It's uh, on the IUCN list or, Global, globally imperiled uh, insects world. So this is a huge find that Jonathan now has for us. And the people that have ID'd it have a very lengthy background in knowledge to be able to ID what he sent to them. So Superman here is, uh, <laughs> thank you, Jonathan. He's always the silent one who's got the camera and taken the, the pictures and, and, and letting us all know what's there. I went through my photos and I, I found one that I had misidentified and it is another crotches bumblebee from 2000. How funny. I so, just want to clarify, when he says misidentified, he didn't th call it the endangered one at the time. He called it something else something and it was else. this yeah. endangered one. So this yeah. is a really significant find on his part. Yeah, let's make sure that we send that to the regulatory agencies, including CFW and um, um, the, and Coastal I, Commission. I will send you what I sent out to people today that I encapsulated this, but 
Jonathan did send it to Brody and to Richard Berg. He got a response, Jonathan, right? That uh, thank you. Brody said thanks. <laughs> Buddy, we're going to have to tie things up here. Anna has a question. So uh, she says, can you put the name of the paper I and just, the conference? Yes. Okay. I just put it in. It's a National Academy of Sciences. People have shaped most of terrestrial nature for at least 12,000 years. That's the title. Published 2021. Just published. Go on the... Um, publications of the National Academy of Sciences, you'll find it. Uh, first of all, Margot, thank you so much for that presentation and for uh, once again sharing all of your insights uh, about the inconsistencies and working towards consensus. It's really important for the work that we're doing. And I think you're turning a lot of people's minds around uh, concerning this. And uh, that's really important. And Jonathan, thank you again for all the work that you're doing and working with Margo in this presentation and all of your wonderful photographs that are always available on Stoneburg. This Thursday is Earth Day. If you may remember, last year we celebrated the 50th anniversary and we've been through a lot since then, uh, including a rather significant uh, milestone today with a verdict uh, in the decision that was made. Um, as, we, as you're going into Earth Day and starting to consider it, we'd like to th you to think about it from a slightly different angle this year. Uh, Earth Day has always been associated with major environmental actions like clean water and clean air and endangered species. And so my question to you is, have they been a success or a failure? Things certainly could be worse without them, but have those actions really protected the environment? Is the water clean? Outdoors? Indoors? There are a lot of issues, and uh, things seem to be getting worse and worse. The environment is in crisis. So this Earth Day, what do we want to do? Should we be celebrating when ecosystems are collapsing and species are disappearing? Maybe we should be more aware of inadequacies and start talking about how to address that and call out the existing system of environmental acts that are not protecting communities with the protections that they need. So how about this Earth Day, instead of doing the same old thing that's not working, let's start thinking and talking about what might be able to go in its place. What do we want to put in its place? And let's start advocating for change, not accepting the way that it's been, but seeing if there isn't another way to protect nature and acknowledging that nature has rights and we need to learn if and how we can guarantee nature's right to exist, to thrive, to flourish, and to regenerate. So that's my plug for Earth Day 2021. Thanks for sharing your evening with us. Um, there's going to be our meeting in May on May 18th, Tuesday. So we'll look forward to seeing you there. Secondvictoryu.org. So Bavunga, Bavunga Los Cerritos Wetlands Sacred Walk on Saturday. Um, and also this Thursday is Earth Day, April 22nd. And here in Playa del Rey, there will be a demonstration at 10.30 a.m. beginning at the intersection of Jefferson and Culver Boulevard to save the Bayona wetlands from being bulldozed and also regarding closing the Southern California gas facility. Um, there is some parking in that area on the, on the street, I think, but it's, it's best to carpool. So, um, and that's what I basically wanted to announce. Thanks, Kathy. I, I just want to say one more thing that the, um, the Gabrielino Tongva people have been living in this area for 10,000 years. They're just amazing. And um, the Bayona Saongna site, of the wetlands, is a registered sacred site uh, of the Tongva people. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, some housekeeping before we begin uh, with the introduction of our guests. Uh, this evening's presentation is called the Biona Wetlands. Can we reach consensus on inconsistencies and overlooked opportunities in the 30% EIR plan? I'd like to advise everyone that this meeting is being recorded. And during tonight's presentation, everybody's going to be muted until sometime toward the end of the presentation, when we'll unmute everyone for a chance to ask questions for the presenters. But at the same time, you can put your questions or remarks into the chat room, and we'll try and field those and then send them on to the present, uh, sorry, the presenters. Before we get to our presentation, um, Judith Davis is, is going to do a tribute. This is in uh, loving memory of Julia Bagani, a venerated Tonga elder who fought for her tribe's recognition. Here's some pictures of her. And then we're gonna run a video. Four years ago, my great granddaughter was doing a, a presentation on the tribe for, um, on the Tongva tribe for her class. And she said, Nana, what does it feel like to be a Tongva woman? And I said, it feels, I feel invisible. I've been doing this for 40 years. And she said, that's how I feel. So I told her, no, you will not be uh, invisible. And so we wrote the book, uh, The Tongva Woman, Inspiring the Future. And then we opened a website to bevisible.org. So about a year ago, we start, we, my cousins and I got together and we decided we didn't want to do blessings anymore because people kind of disrespect the idea of what a blessing is, not understanding who we're praying to, right? Uh, so it's, we decided that we would do uh, land acknowledgement. So for the last year, I've been doing land acknowledgements, uh, giving our answer, giving that respect to our ancestors that we're here for a time of memorial uh, and letting the public know that we're here not only to continue to teach today but to honor the people that live here today so it's about all of us working together and not just us right and so because i think sometimes people think oh they Acknowledging the land that the Tongva are here is going to take that, um, it's, they want something, right? So I say that it's not about, it's not about wanting something. I say the land was not stolen because it wasn't ours, but the responsibility of taking the land was, it was taken. Because when you take something, you can, re you can either return it or you can make good, right? But if you steal something, you can never return it because you're not going to admit you stole it. So I say it wasn't ours from the beginning. The responsibility of taking care of the land is what was taken. So, and how we honor that. So right now, in uh, Cal State system, in the Cal State system, in their union, they're going. Uh, I've been doing it at several Cal States, but it's going to go to all 64 Cal States throughout California. Uh, the Autry is doing it. Um, Fort Deer, different um, people, yes, friends that have businesses, have, businesses say we are on Tongva land, and that's good enough yeah. because it's just because it, it questions who are the people right? Who are these Tongva? Because people don't know us. When the relocation happened, people came to California thinking this was the promised land. They didn't know there was already tribes there. They thought we were already wiped out. So today it's about acknowledging that we're here. On behalf of the AMG, I would like to begin tonight with a tribute for Tongva Elder Julia Bagani, 
who recently passed away to a, due to a stroke and her funeral took place just this past Saturday. Those of you members who came to our meetings in October and November, Julia, together with Tina and Jessica Calderon, spoke about the Bayona wetlands, offering prayer songs, and Julia read a blessing of the water in our presentation of Bayona as a Tongva sacred site. Water is sacred, water is life. Julia's website is a valuable insight into all that she was doing, www.tobevisible.org. It would be impossible to list it all here, but we encourage you to look at it. Julia's lifelong goal was to make Tongva people visible to the world, and she certainly was successfully doing that. We're showing a portion here of the video on her site that explains it in her own words. There's so much more on that site. I would really encourage you to go to that. Sharing some personal thoughts here of my own, she was such a special person, even in the brief time that I knew her, thanks to the suggestion of Chief Anthony Morales. I was amazed at all she was doing to share her knowledge, her teaching and representing uh, the Tongva so that people would learn about the history, culture, language, customs, prayers, relationship to nature, and so many other aspects of the indigenous peoples who who have been here for thousands of years that we need to know. I learned many other things about Julia recently. She was born in Santa Monica, was an artist, and loved to work with other artists to enjoy the creative ways to speak through the arts. I don't know if you were able to get that uh, exhibit uh, at the Santa Monica Historical Museum of her standing. Julia was... Uh, uh, instrumental in, in having this show happen, an exhibition, I believe it was in 2018 at the Santa Monica Historical Museum, featuring all of these artifacts and historical information on the Tongva and their um, presence here throughout the ages. As an artist, I only wish I could have worked with her on future projects as well. We will miss her. Count me in as another one whose life was changed because of her. I wish I could have worked with her more on future projects, but I am grateful and I feel very thankful to have met her and we all have been blessed by her presence. Others have been touched by her kindness, her patience and dedication, and will continue with conviction on the path to continue the work she accomplished. I re also read that she was very involved in the Claremont Colleges um, and particularly Scripps and Pitzer College. I am an alum of Scripps many ages ago, uh, and I'm happy to know that they will finally have a concentration of studies in the area of Native American Indigenous peoples. I'm sure uh, that Julia, we can thank for that. I also have learned how involved she was in protecting Povunga in uh, the Long Beach area, uh, the Los Cerritos wetlands. And I see that there's a walk, as uh, Kathy has pointed out, there's a walk and rally happening next Saturday, which Larry and I hope to attend, especially in her honor and with those who will follow in her footsteps. Okay, thank you, Judith. I think right now, before we continue, could we have a moment of silence and pay tribute to Julia? Okay, thanks again, Judith. <laughs> 